I have been studying the genesis, meanings, and reception of modern art in Central and Eastern Europe for a long time. From the early 1970s, I, like so many others, were naive accomplices in promoting some of the dominant myths of modernism. Over the last 25 years, and more emphatically during the last decade or so, I have grown acutely sensitive to the limitations of these long dominant modernist methods and their ideological assumptions. I want to rehearse some of them here this morning, as being aware of them might serve as a guide toward a reconsideration of alternative and more nuanced practices. First, as young scholars in the 1960s, I'm embarrassed to say, then continuing into the early 21st century, we tended to take all too seriously the writings of the founding figures of modernism itself, especially its original artists, impresarios, and critics. These were people, primarily white men, who took themselves and their mission perhaps too seriously. For what they all agreed upon, despite their many theoretical and personal differences, was that art itself actually matters in the course of human events and their histories. All assumed with only the most cursory interrogation that the modern arts had a fundamentally redemptive function. That is, the arts, and especially the visual arts, if properly positioned, promoted, and designed, could envision a better society and a new man to inhabit it. This redeemed world with its new Adams and its new Eves would be one where social inequities would be overcome, where nature's vagaries would be checked, and where irrationality would be replaced by harmonious relations and meaningful integration. In short, the makers of modernism believed wholeheartedly that their art might serve as a moral template in which the viewer could recognize in the compositional order a model to be transposed to the world beyond the canvas. In retrospect, or at least in my perspective, this reliance on art as a moral prompt or as a social condenser, to use a favored turn of the 1920s, puts too much emphasis on the authority of visuality to affect social change, even if a work of art can affect the individual, individual profoundly in an aesthetic manner. Of course, most of those who advocated this redemptive potency of modern art were themselves less often practitioners than promoters, less often makers than impresarios. And from their rostrums as editors, organizers, critics, or philosophers, they were free to promote the idea of modernism as reformatory and as progressive. In the ringing of often overstated declamation of Karol Kernstock, leader of Hungary's first avant-garde formation, the Seekers, Karoshuk, quote, the artist will occupy the highest rung of the social ladder where, even if he will not be conversing with the gods, he will provide direction for the masses. His work will be that ray of light that will penetrate the vast dark jungle of society to convey light and shade, depth and splendor." Close quotes. If the faith in the agency of modern art was idealized, so too was the belief in its character and even in its reach. For a second myth of modernism, was the assumption that it was inherently rational, both in what, it in what it depicted and in its effect. Moreover, the rationality of pictorial relationships that was both the subject and means of modernism was assumed by its defenders and practitioners to be universally valid. Perhaps Le Corbusier stated it most baldly when he claimed that his rational architecture was as appropriate, quote, for Eskimos as it was applicable to the Congo. In other words, the modernist reliance on a carefully composed, logically ordered design, canvas, or assembled sculpture would have universal currency because it incarnated rationality as an organizing principle. Indeed, unlike the emotionality of, say, expressionism, or the stridency of Italian futurism, or the infamous reliance on literature or history on which other styles of art were predicated, 
a rational modernism <laughs> of pure abstract forms might overcome geography, time, and individuality to address and elevate everyone, everywhere, and at every moment. Through their mostly unexamined trust in the potency and universality of an aesthetics of rationalism, modernists held that humankind might ultimately be redeemed from the vagaries of history, nature, and its own limitations. In their excessive confidence in the value and authority of, our, of their art, modernists appropriated the character of the engineer and sometimes that of the scientist. But if the self-image as the rational investigator of universal truths and eternal verities, moral as well as aesthetic, was not limited to dress, as we see here in the architect's self-portrait, it was a fundamental characteristic of the artist's writings as well. Indeed, there was a widely held belief that a modern art could function as a kind of visual laboratory science in which matter and measure are seen to be rational, functional, and systematic. In a profound sense, the philosophy and practice of abstraction, especially geometrical abstraction, was decisively based on such a worldview. What was appealing about the claim to rationality in the modernism from Amsterdam to Zagreb was not only its modeling of compositional forms, but rather the faith that such an orchestration could transmit a canvas's self-control to the mentality of the viewer. Thus, the message was not just the formal medium, it was the transformation and consequent salvation of art's audience. Although one might appreciate the nobility of the artist's belief in the redemptive nature of modern art, we must also recognize that this claim had little resonance beyond the various artist formations themselves. Few politicians, economists, or industrialists subscribe to the audacious claims being made by the avant-garde. And truth be told, the appeal to the general public was also extremely limited. Even the most widely subscribed modernist journal, the Dutch De Style, with its broad international circulation, never had more than 310 paid subscriptions, although, it is likely, although its likely readerships surely superseded this modest number. Nonetheless, the reliance on publications as an import, is an important issue to raise here. For it is arguable that the classical avant-gardes, especially those from East Central Europe, produced as many texts as paintings as many theoretical tracts as sculpture, and even more essays and articles than either architecture or decorative objects. In broadsides, manifestos, and especially journals, the makers of modernism in Middle Europe proved to be as adept with the pen as they were original with the brush, the pencil, and the straight edge. Perhaps this verbal fluency is the most distinctive marker of their period and place, as few earlier visual artists were as skilled with or as reliant upon the potency of the word as were the creative artists in Budapest, Bucharest, Zagreb, Belgrade, Wuj, and Prague, among other centers of avant-garde activity, including here in Poznan. Of course, painters and sculptors and other practitioners of visual arts had often written to explain or to justify what they sought to achieve with brush, chisel, or chalk. From the Italian Renaissance through the 19th century, visual artists had expressed themselves eloquently in words, often to explain their intentions or to persuade potential employers of their talents. But never before the earlier, early 20th century, and seldom since, have visual artists seized upon the written word with such passion, purpose, and prolixity. It was as if the classical modernists aspired to make the word powerfully visible, or conversely, to empower the visual to be read as if a text. This convergence of communication, a conjunction of text and image, points up various social, political, and aesthetic factors that collectively redefine the tasks 
and provided the methods for the strikingly inventive modern art that emerged throughout Europe in the years immediately preceding and then during the decade following the First World War. Text frequently trumped image, or at least an elevated visual display to a higher plane by explaining, contextualizing, and often justifying its aims and claims. My point here is simply to register the comparative limitation of the visual arts, even in the hands of those who practice and advocated them. The word remained primary, even if the impresarios of the avant-garde wished to vest vision with universality, rationality, and redemptive dominance. Therefore, we must keep well in mind that any methodology of modernism should account for the priority of text as much as on the potency of the images it idealizes. Words are inexorably read, even if modern artists may have wished them to be essentially seen. And this fact brings to the surface not only the role of reading versus seeing, which time does not permit us today to engage properly, but also the specificity of text, namely language. Words, language, are never universal in their currency. They are, by function, as particular as they are disparate in referencing and responding to the individual character of national tongues. But there is a further dimension to this issue that I wish to point to here, one with, one with which the artists and their defenders constantly and often creatively engaged. This is a challenge of affirming the specific or the national while simultaneously operating transnationally or globally. A Latvian porcelain plate by Roman Sutta might be cited as a successful, if very limited, example. In 1924, Sutta served as a co-founder of the Baltar's porcelain manufactory, which he hoped would function as the ideal medium of disseminating modernist design articles of everyday use. Inspired both by the nativist arts and crafts movement and by the inventive suprematist porcelain being produced by Russian modernists, Sutap made effective use of ceramic ware to propagate the evolving Latvian culture. Within a year of its founding, Baltars garnered international recognition. Three metals, including the gold, at the 1925 Decorative Arts Exposi Exposition in Paris. Nevertheless, by about 1926, the creative fusion of folkloric and modernist elements began to break down. Perhaps the last signal accomplishment of this inventive mixture is Sutta's wedding plate now being projected. Here, the traditional celebration takes center stage. The triangular forms of the women's trailing fringe shawls and the segmented composition introduce a rigorous geometry to the scene. But it is on the rim where the melding of styles and the deeper content are most dramatically served up. A bride and groom stand to either side, each holding a suprematist triangular, flat, solidly colored textile. Around them and coursing the plate's border are geometrical elements, circles, rectangles, and hard-edged forms, all calling to mind the suprematism employed, by, employed in the Petrograd State porcelain manufactory of the time. But here, these forms have another, reference of, another dimension of reference, one that departs from the presumed universality of Malievich's geometry. This reference is suggested by the reductively rendered deer near the top. The primitive form of the animal is perfectly fitting, as all the abstract planes, arcs, and circles of earthen colors derive as much from the ethnographic studies and archaeological excavations sponsored by the newly independent Latvian state as they owe allegiance to Russian modernism. Indeed, government-supported ethnographic projects were part of the popular endeavor to reveal and assert the nation's unique cultural and spiritual character, indebted to neither of its erstwhile social and economic masters, namely the Russians and the Germans. Hence, the abstract forms around the rim invoke an atavism uncovered through excavation, 
that was presumed to predate the Slavic and German arrival. Sutta's potent stylistic blend of the abstract and the figurative, the native and the cosmopolitan, was an imaginative solution, and it points to the striking ability of progressive forms to resonate locally while also being read generally or globally. It is this duality that is important to recognize, for it was as aspirational throughout East Central and Southeastern Europe as it was rare in the centralized cultural capitals to the West, especially in Paris and Berlin. What I am suggesting through this example is the need for a more sensitized method to comprehend the often uncanny ways the local and the transnational can be adduced, if not oh, always straightforwardly laid bare. Yes, there was a broad desire to engage the universal, to be global, but this was often conjoined with the hope of affirming the national, even if it was almost impossible for a single audience to grasp both references simultaneously. The reviewers in Paris, for example, praised Sutta's plate for its striking suprematist forms, while his audience at home celebrated it for its nativist references. I have found no commentary so far that acknowledged both sides to Sutta's monumental aspiration to resonate in this modern, this modest piece of dinnerware. In some respects, these several modernist practices and the methodologies to which they were and often remain tethered are not difficult for us today to acknowledge. Far more challenging, perhaps, and significantly more consequential for how we might engage modern and especially contemporary art is another problematic, one with which I would like to conclude my remarks today. Succinctly stated, this is the all too persistent myth of modernism, essentializing the twinning of progressive aesthetics and progressive politics. With Sutta's porcelain still on the screen, we can see how he sought to reconcile a backward-looking Latvian nat nativism with a formalist utopianism inspired by revolutionary Russian examples. Such inventive ideological and artistic blends were less oxymoronic than symptomatic of a common practice still almost totally overlooked by today's commentators. For all too little attention has been paid to this creative combination of conservative reference or ideology on the one hand and modernist contemporary methods or forms on the other. This willful blindness, or at least one-sidedness, is likely due to a prevailing association of liberal values with modernist forms. Although powerfully advanced by many of modernism's greatest innovators, the union of liberal attitudes and revolutionary means represents only one side of a fully rounded modernism. It is true that a few scholars have notably pointed out that even the most respected of modernist forefathers, such as Walter Gropius or Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, sought to accommodate, the, accommodate their daring pedagogical and architectural programs to the demands both of leftist local governments and later to the early Nazi regime. But we need to recognize that a similar ideological flexibility can be observed through much of Europe during the first third of the 20th century, when modernists negotiated between democracy and dictatorship, or between a reactionary nativism and a liberal transnationalism. This ideological multifariousness had its historical impetus in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a time when comparative studies often brought to the surface art's variability, both stylistically and conceptually. However, this once dominant mold of discourse has long been discredited, as it was nefariously employed under authoritarian regimes to promote claims of ethnic, national, or racial priority, as it may be doing today. Nonetheless, the self-awareness and open-mindedness that characterize much of today's art history encourage a reconsideration of the conservative valence of modernist aesthetics. To do so is to recognize that there is a salutary complement to the liberal or radical aspect of avant-garde aesthetics, and that together the wholeness of modernism 
might best be perceived. Perhaps no example more instructively represents a creative conservative amalgam of aesthetic progressivism and reactionary ideology than the Catalonian modernism of Luis Domenech y Montaner. Domenech pursued an ingenious expression appropriate for a modernizing era by acknowledging the gravitational pull of local history, traditions, and religious values while combining them with the most thoroughgoing aesthetic progressivism of his moment. Domenech was the leading figure both politically and culturally of his time and place, having been elected president of Catalonia as a result of his combination of advanced aesthetics and right-wing ideology. And of course, there was likely a legion of other modernists who seized upon progressive aesthetics to promote a conservative, often reactionary, cultural political ideology. Thus, it is important to acknowledge that there is an alternative modernism at play that has rarely been incorporated into the dominant stories of modern and contemporary art and architecture. This would constitute a history of powerfully modern monuments arising from a forceful advocacy of political conservatism. And such a heady blend of innovative styles and means, along with forward-thinking methods, was frequently united with a rejection of the very kinds of liberalism we are accustomed to expect from reformist artists. I am in no way advocating one history of modernism over another. Rather, I am arguing for a broadening of our methodological and historical practices to recognize, incorporate, and ultimately to come to terms with the contradictions and complexity of modernism itself. My objective this morning has been an ambitious one. Through recognizing as mythological or partisan several of the methodological assumptions that have long animated our treatment of modern art, we might reposition ourselves to look with fresh eyes at the very art we have accepted less than critically. Perhaps we can go a step further, maybe by freeing ourselves from the many methodolo methodological fictions that have characterized the perception of modernism, we can open ourselves to the very moral and aesthetic redemption that so many modern artists had themselves passionately desired. Thank you.